Whenever you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just introduce you, uh, Bill, for one second. I want to thank uh, I want to thank MCAD and AI Miami for putting this together. Uh, we're going to uh, introduce William Lane from William Lane Architects. He is the original designer of the Lifeguard Card Towers back in 1995, and he redesigned them for. Uh, for the city of Miami Beach a few years ago, and he's going to speak a little bit about that today. Bill, it's all yours. Hey, everyone. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, being here. I see a lot of uh, friends uh, I've known for quite a long time here in Miami. And uh, so I guess I start with my screen here, right here. Hey, so to begin with, um, my name is William Lane. I'm an architect. Uh, I've lived here in Miami since 1992, uh, originally from New York. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey before coming to Miami. I lived in the Caribbean for about six years. So, um, you know, I guess I'm a tropical person. Um, I might want to start with just uh, the the background to me coming here in Miami and uh, a little bit of the history. So to start with, where are you? Is it here? This thing here. Okay. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to you know give a nod to Barbara Catman, uh, specifically because uh, of her efforts to preserve the Art Deco district. Um, here in Miami, which uh, really became uh, consequential uh, in terms of, I think, where Miami Beach went uh, since, you know, the 80s and 70s. So, you know, here's a great picture of her with, you know, that wonderful save me behind her, but quite a woman and uh, really remarkable. And so I guess I'd like to begin with her and, and thank her for you know, everything that she's done for us. So, you know, to quickly go in and talk about context. Is that, can I use this? Okay. To begin with context, uh, I'd like to just review some uh, of the architecture here in Miami Beach, uh, the Art Deco, and just show some of the images, which again, really impacted me, uh, not only when I moved here, but before, when I first visited Miami back in uh, the mid eighties, early eighties. So, and just show you a couple slides of those pictures and I'm sure everyone's very aware of uh, this architecture. Um, just wonderful. And certainly some of the things that happened uh, to with the architecture at that time where color was introduced um, significantly uh, to help, uh, I guess, further the preservation. Um, and then another quick nod to Sunny Isles. Uh, which is um, unfortunately did not get uh, the opportunity to be preserved. And, um, you know, some really wonderful things up there too that uh, impacted me and, and some of the uh, things that we did with the lifeguard towers. You know, a lot of very, what I would call narrative architecture. You know, really amazing stuff. Um, here, you know, just sort of a couple slides of showing the, you know, what happened where we went from a very kind of quiet Cuban Jewish retirement uh, community to sort of the epicenter for design and photo shots. You know, this is a, a great uh, photo shot from, uh, you know, somewhere on Loomis Park and then a Versace ad. And another one, just some, uh, miscellaneous pictures of the beach back then. So I'm maybe hopping around on this one. Um, of course, uh, one of the things that led to the first 
set of designs was Hurricane Andrew. And uh, basically, uh, I had moved that year, 1992, from uh, the Virgin Islands, where I had been um, also impacted by Hurricane Hugo. So it was almost like hurricanes were following me. Um, but uh, it uh, made me think, I when I was living in New York, uh, uh, I had done some work in public spaces. And when the lifeguard towers uh, were destroyed, I immediately thought this was a, a great opportunity to come up with something new and refreshing. So on that note, we go into the first designs. So um, there were five of them. And the first design stretched from 5th Street up to 15th Street, 10 blocks on Loomis, uh, Loomis Park. And uh, they were separated basically every two blocks. Um, they were, in, in essence, uh, beach follies. Um, again, very influenced by MIMO and by Art Deco architecture, but also other things. You know, my, my background uh, in New York uh, as, uh, as a student, an art student, an architecture student, I had, uh, you know, interest in, um, you know, a lot of other things, which I'll, I'll be sharing with you, you know, things that kind of led up to this particular design, set of designs. So these were the five that uh, we kind of began with. Now, this is uh, sort of uh, one that uh, was pivotal, it was on 10th Street. This one I did in collaboration with Kenny Sharp, an artist who lived here um, from 1992 to uh, 1999. And uh, then he moved on to LA. People, I knew Kenny from New York. Um, these were some designs that kind of came out of the Lifeguard Tower project. And they were studies that were done for um, uh, Miami Beach for the convention center. Um, they were basically um, what I would call uh, sort of events, activity zones that we did for the beach. Uh, the one on the left is a uh, beach end. The, the middle one would be, I guess, uh, sort of a kiosk uh, uh, food opportunity. And then the third one would be uh, another lifeguard tower. <clears throat> and then here, at that time, we were doing beach dune walkovers. So the idea here on the left was to um, have these little kiosks be identified with the hotel. So this is just another kind of uh, uh, take on the initial design and how that could uh, move through the beach. So I wanted to go back to some of the influences I had, you know, coming up to uh, this particular design and wanted to start with some of the more basic stuff that we as art students uh, experienced in New York, which was uh, in the 70s, there's a lot of conceptual art, but minimalism. Uh, we have on the left a piece by Donald Judd and Carl Andre in upper right, lower right, Dan Flavin. But think about them and how it relates to the lifeguard towers was this idea of serialism and re repetitive uh, design. So the, I think in some ways, this kind of led me to the idea of uh, these utilitarian objects being static, but having an opportunity to dress them, uh, give them, you know, so to speak, a facade, which is kind of what was going on with the deco architecture too. Um, another typology, serialism, is the work of uh, Byrne and Hilla Becker. Um, and these were German artists who basically documented a lot of uh, uh, industrial architecture, residential architecture in Europe, and um, organized in a very, you know, sort of static way. But it was often, it was really variations on a theme. And I just found it so fascinating, you know, when you look at it in terms of some of the serialism that was uh, taking place with, you know, the artists that I had just shown you previously. So there's a certain dryness in this, which you know really was at the time. But you know, as things sort of changed, uh, um, 
you know, we began to see how this idea of serialism could be employed uh, in terms of, you know, a larger expression of art. So, you know, another thing that influenced me uh, was I went to Cooper Union and the dean at the school, John Hiddick, was uh, a paper architect, so to speak. And uh, he <clears throat> did a lot, of, uh, a lot of smaller buildings, which he kind of used as a form of theater. And um, he wanted to imbue them with character. There was a, there was a, a bit of surrealism going on. They were a little dark, but a lot of the, a lot of the work that he did really did um, influence me a lot with um, actually the during the initial towers. Here's some more of his work. Let me jump into another influence, uh, which is OMA. This is two pictures or uh, illustrations from Delirious New York. And uh, you can see here where um, Rum was using a lot of narrative. Um, this idea of uh, buildings taking on a, a kind of animism, uh, similar to Haydick, where a building can start to suggest, um, you know, a biomorphic or anthropomorphic quality. And I think this was somewhat present uh, in architecture, you know, at that time. It, Still somewhat is, but uh, another influence. Then we jump into another form of serialism with the Warhol and the Keith Haring, um, where you know these artists brought in uh, everyday uh, aspects into their work. So it began to, when you look at uh, Warhol, for instance, and you look at a lot of the minimalism and serialism, you can see where he really stood out. He was able to morph that into something even grander with these uh, overlays of narrative. <clears throat> um, some work by Kenny Scharf, um, also showing uh, this anthropomorphism uh, where it meets uh, you know, a, a, a really intense form of graphic art. And uh, even further, uh, some animation on the left is cars by Pixar, where you know these uh, these cars are animated and are, are given uh, sort of a, a biomorphic quality. And on the right, this is an interesting show. When the the, the images I showed of uh, Byrne and Hilla Becker were on exhibition at the Metropolitan, actually they might still be there. <clears throat> there was also a show there of Walt Disney and. Um, specifically animators who uh, were very influenced by uh, the French decorative arts. And it was, you know, to me, it was fascinating because, you know, when you, when I thought back um, as far as <clears throat> Hollywood and the fact that there were a lot of writers, creatives, creators <clears throat> who uh, immigrated to LA from Europe uh, during the war, and a lot of them were surrealists. And so this idea of high and low art um, always fascinated me. Um, <clears throat> you know, you have the formalism um, of art, and you know, but you also have here the uh, sort of the narrative um, of pop culture coming in and how that <clears throat> is distributed to the people, to the public. So again, going back to the original Lifeguard Tower project, you know, it was a great way of extending art um, by way of a utilitarian object to the general public, art in public places. <clears throat> um, another influence, my Caribbean experience. Um, on the left uh, are some beach huts from Cape Town, Africa. And on the right are some images of similar cabanas in the Bahamas. So. You know, we really have the flavor of, uh, you know, this sort of um, bungalow style architecture, which um, was really enjoyable when I was down in the, uh, in the Virgin Islands. I had been working in New York at Ian Pei's office. So to go from corporate architecture to this other scale was really, you know, quite an experience. I learned a lot and then, of course, employed a, a bit of that into the 
design of those uh, uh, initial towers, lifeguard stands. Um, and then finally here, another you know, illustration of animism. Uh, you know, I've always uh, had a fascination with Jung and you know, the collective unconscious and archetypes. And so again, you know, a reference here, you know, Easter Island and the Maui uh, figures that were discovered, um, um, you know, I guess in the 19th century. So just really beautiful things. These are all sort of underlying influences. So this brings us up to today. Um, so in uh, 2014, I was approached by the city of Miami Beach to help them come up with some uh, prototypes for new lifeguard towers based on some of the things we had done back in the 90s. So um, the thing that was really incredible about this project was the scale and the fact that we were now doing a project that would be now seven miles long. And you know the imagery still sustained itself. We wanted to bring that back in. It was still relevant. Um, the thing that was really notable was the scale and that uh, we were able to do this really huge public, in, in a sense, large public uh, project using these small iconic towers as the essence of the of the project. And you know, you know, we all know now that they became very iconic and have been used to, in a way, um, identify they become identify or identities for Miami. Um, so this is a, a, a photograph uh, by a photographer, Tommy Quack, who is actually you know, also influenced by the Becker's work. Um, the fun thing is, of course, that he was able to transpose this with the colors and the beach location, but it has somewhat of the same solemn kind of nature of the Becker's, and yet it, it, it kind of represents the, the project in this surrealistic um, fashion that you know, I've been you know, alluding to. So this is a, a couple of photographs of the towers. Uh, the one on the left is uh, South Beach, the one on the right is North Beach. And I kind of like them because they, you know, they begin to read as cars. Um, you know, the, the lifeguard towers were never allowed to have foundations. They were always meant to be mobile. So there's, you know, that, that, that aspect too, to the design of where these, these little caricatures um, had this idea of mobility. And so it just further, you know, iterated um, sort of the, them as being these, um, uh, I guess, almost uh, emoji-like characters. Um, here's uh, the first prototype, prototype one. <clears throat> Very generic. Uh, what what we were asked to do would be to uh, create, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a uniform stand for the towers. They wanted a bit of uniformity in order to make them, uh, uh, I guess, able to be mass produced. So the the basic uh, foundation was something that was replicable. It was only the upper tower certain components that became customized. And so that really helped out with, um, you know, just the timing that being able to uh, move these from the warehouse where they were constructed into the field. Um, everything is tongue and groove, uh, siding, the um, heavy timber post and beam, the connectors are all metal galvanized, uh, galvanized struts, uh, really basic construction, the roof, standing seam, uh, aluminum roof, um, aluminum rails, very simple construction. So here we go, I mean, kind of go through this like a runway, um, just because there's a lot of images that I have here and um, kind of ramble on about uh, the design. Um, this particular tower, interestingly enough, they recently painted it with the um, 
gay flag. And I wish I had an image of that, but I don't. But um, this one has been changed um, a bit. Uh, this is another one, same prototype. I, I wanted these towers <clears throat> to be, in the very beginning, I always wanted them to be um, diverse and to suggest, it's funny because they're of the time, they were kind of progressive, this nature of uh, colors suggesting a rainbow of culture. And one of the things I had issues with, with the, uh, the tower that was painted with the, the rainbow flower colors was that it kind of brought things back to, I guess, 12th Street, which was the gay beach. And um, I, I always felt that when the towers were um, sort of distributed along the seven mile stretch, that this idea of politics was now everywhere that you know one could be gay and could be at any particular beach. Um, so you know, going back to diversity, I wanted these things to appeal to every age group, you know, everyone. It, they were meant to be fun, to be, you know, what they are, you know, just very whimsical. Um, and uh, you know, something for the, the overall the people. This is up in North Beach. So what we did was we had the six prototypes. Each one was sort of repeated. And every time they were repeated, the color wheel changed so that we, in the end, ended up having a, each tower was unique in terms of color. Another one. Again, sort of a runway. One of my favorite colors. Prototype two, um, basically riffing on uh, streamline, um, just some mid-century lines there. Again, just figures, shapes, sculpture, all with this flayed base, which kind of connotates a skier. I wanted them to, again, you know, suggest movement. So just by the skis and the, the long board box being kind of held um, like something like a, like a backpack of sorts, I wanted them to communicate a vehicle. Um, these were designed for a couple of lifeguards. So they also had that quality of uh, some kind of biomimicry and they had the four legs, they had the windows in the front with the two eyes. They, they really took on um, each one a type of persona, which I guess goes back to my sort of my interest in um, the collective unconscious and uh, archetypes. So, you know, you're seeing here kind of woven in there, you know, interest in serialism, minimalism, uh, mass production, uh, Caribbean style architecture, color, fantasy. And uh, you know, it's kind of cool, the, the image on the right, uh, just the scale difference of these and how nicely they complement uh, you know, the, the beach. And particularly now where a lot of the architecture to the, uh, the west of the dune is now monochromatic, a lot of white um, architecture. And so these towers, kind of signify something. They, they're a standalone. And the fact that they're between the dune and the ocean, it, it's kind of a little bit of a spiritual thing for me, especially at night or early in the morning when I walk by and I see these figures that um, carry kind of a spirituality, a, um, a presence. And somewhat like the Mari, uh, figures on Easter Island, they, they almost are, act like sentinels facing the ocean um, and just very meditative. Um, and of course they're utilitarian and they provide amazing uh, experience here in Miami where we can be at almost any beach and, and feel safe um, with our incredible ocean rescue. And it just, it makes Miami beach a really, really special place. So going through these, very pink, very fun. More. Prototype three, 
again, a lot of it's about form, color, uh, sculpture, um, basic wood construction, uh, variation on a theme, um, you know, handmade. Uh, there's something kind of wonderful about the flags and the signs. Um, I had worked on the Freehand Hotel with Romeo Williams, and they had this touch where they always add a little bit of non-design to the design. So when they put these signs up, I really didn't mind. I thought they, they added a, a little bit of reality, um, a little bit of non-design to the very strong design. And just sort of a remark on that. So again, our pink theme. It's funny, this one here, you can see where the, uh, the vertical pipe, they're no longer there, but they were kind of used as a you know, second means of, for the lifeguards. Here we are up in North Beach. This was the final tower that went up, I guess in 20, uh, it must have been, uh, the end of 2019, the first one was uh, completed or the last one was completed. And one of my favorites, really love this one in particular, just the color and the shape. It's just very light and so beachy and with North, North Beach Park behind it, just amazing experience up there. Another one, this one was repeated twice, somehow the color. But one of the things you can see here too is up on top, you kind of see the, um, the they, they have lightning protection on all these and they in turn were then grounded. So this prototype four, another nod to one of the uh, original five towers. Um, this, you know, it was all about the roof line. And the roof line, like a haircut or you know, some facial feature was what distinguished them from each other, a family of six, and, uh, you know, six different uh, uh, takes on that, almost like cutouts, cutout dolls, and, um, or, you know, choosing your car with the, you know, particular upholstery or, you know, color or feature. Another tower up in uh, North Beach, Again, I'm going to do some runway here. The cap in pink. Another one. Again, the scale. The scale was pretty incredible. Just the fact that uh, um, it, it goes for seven miles and that you can walk from uh, one tower to another. This one shows the, we had originally a, like an air funnel on one of the first five and we had, uh, our intent was to incorporate it into this new design. And then at one moment we decided to take it out. Um, we just felt that uh, it was risky. Um, previously there had been some uh, vandalism and it was an economic thing too, but we, we really felt that the design stood on its own. Um, kind of Hayduck influence uh, with these horns, the uh, inverted roof. <clears throat> so, you know, certainly a nod to uh, his work and his uh, sort of his idea of, you know, these buildings having uh, a certain kind of uh, narrative animism. Again, done in different colors and the funkiness of the flags and the signage, I think just add to the, the genuine quality of the, uh, the lifeguard towers. This one is uh, the second from the end. So completing the series. Prototype six. Um, of course, this is uh, based on the um, original 10th Street lifeguard tower that um, I did in collaboration with Kenny Scharf. So, you know, there's some, uh, you know, definitely alludes to different things, uh, rocket ships, uh, um, you know, uh, I guess Sputnik, um, water towers, 
concession stands. I mean, all of them kind of allude to different uh, small scale architecture, um, ticket booths, um, lighthouse. Uh, there's all kinds of things that one could uh, see that's implied. This one, this is on 10th Street. So kind of uh, keeping the vibe. You know, what we wanted to do with the round ones was to use them as markers. Um, we have one on Lincoln Road. We have one on 10th Street. We want to position them at, I guess, important, uh, you know, intervals where we had uh, major streets coming in and somewhat successful. This is fun because it shows some of the original jetty, uh, one of the few uh, relics of the jetty here on the beach. More. opportunities in public space. So I think uh, the again, because of the second iteration, um, the thing that was most dramatic about it was the scale and also how much it impacted uh, people's experience um, and memory of Miami Beach. And, uh, you know, we see this ha having happened to like for instance, with the High Line, where this very small one and a half mile stretch of um, abandoned rail railway was uh, reutilized and um, you know created a new experience. And I think in the same way, the lifeguard towers basically took a very um, utilitarian object and gave it another layer, another kind of magic. Mm -hmm. And I think good design, good urban design. Uh, does that. And I, I saw that um, actually Beth Dunlop came on board. And Beth, I remember back in the day, uh, wrote about the lifeguard towers and basically said that uh, it's interesting that something so small had the power to have such a uh, major impact uh, in terms of design, that design matters and that uh, public space matters. So, um, you know, I, you know, I think that uh, the, the project works in that way. It, it kind of brought um, uh, the beach to another place and you know, really made uh, Miami Beach you know, its own, had its own unique uh, statement. So something about the, our city. Um, here's another project um, that does the same thing. This was designed by Hargreaves and Associates and Savino Miller, of course, the South Point Park. Remarkable in terms of the landform, this uh, incredible earthwork that uh, they incorporated into the design, the ecological features, but even more so um, the fact that it has become such an iconic, um, you know, uh, another iconic uh, element in uh, for Miami Beach, aside, of course, from its deco architecture, just another layer. Um, I think North Beach Park will also be uh, really important in terms of that kind of reading. But this park is um, quite unique. Uh, um, and we had helped out with the little pavilion there, um, trying to view that. We we're looking at uh, birds, nests, and uh, uh, anemones, and you know, different uh, sea life. So we wanted to create a uh, sort of a biomimicry in that. And of course, uh, Park La Villette in Paris, where these follies that uh, the architect uh, Bernard Schumi employed almost as markers in which to move through the park, um, kind of signifiers. And uh, again, for Paris, uh, became uh, important public space and kind of iconic to their, to their um, identity. Um, going to iconic, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, what happened with these uh, towers over time and how they became so used and branded, um, surprisingly so. And uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about how um, you know buildings you know can create identity to a community and how these particular simple little towers um, you know in, in some ways did do that. And uh, you know here's a great little illustration of markers that you might, you know, see, uh, be familiar with of, um, you know, instantaneously, you, you look at one and you know what, where it's from, where, you know, what city, uh, et cetera. So 
On the first go round, uh, a lot of the towers were shown in publications, a lot of travel guides. I mean, it was really cool. Terence Conran, um, you featured it on the, a book he wrote called Small Spaces, and that was really an amazing uh, acknowledgement. Um, and uh, yeah, Farmers, you know, Lonely Planet. So it's kind of cool that, uh, you know, people use this as uh, a way of, with one simple image, kind of inferring where you're going, location, um, des you know, where your destiny is. And again, today, this is where we're gonna kind of, um, you know, end the presentation, but now everything's on in the form of web, so some of my more favorite uh, websites that featured this, uh, Wallpaper, El Decor, Domus, uh, G2, Living, you know, on and on. There's quite a few, um, but just, again, remarkable that, you know, it's taken on sort of its own life. Um, and that's really it. It's a really quick presentation, and I hope I didn't ramble too much. And uh, I would love to, you know, take some questions and hear some people you know, get a little bit of uh, interaction. Uh, awesome, Bill. Thank you for that. We do have some questions. Uh, starting off, you speak of these as these, uh, these towers as avatars, almost a, almost a direct representation of, you know, culture, emotion, or environment. Uh, the ocean, the sand, the sun, the waves, beach goers, the sky. Uh, were these some of the cultural components that inspired their representation? They what? Were these some of the components that, that inspired their representation? You know, the waves, the sun, the, yeah. the ocean, the beachgoers. They, they almost act as these hieroglyphs. So what was the direct representation? What was the direct influence behind them? Well, you know, you, you can go right back to some major graphic components, square, circle, triangle. And... You know, these were constructed basically with, you know, very simple geometries that, you know, were such that, you know, we, we wanted them always to distinguish themselves. So there was the thing that kind of united them in terms of scale and function, but the geometry was determined by, you know, just basic, um, you know, geometric components and basic color combinations. So, you know, all the other references, like the fact that it, it kind of looks like a car, uh, it has a biomimicry, you know, a little bit happening. It, it could be that it's just the nature of um, our constructs as humans, uh, as animals. You know, the things that we use as tools, vehicles, will often correspond to us, you know, having four limbs and two eyes and two ears. And so they just by nature um, kind of reflect who and what we are as, a, as animals. So it's, yeah, it's there, there's some really primal things going on there. Face. Great. Here's another, uh, another question by Felice Gordon. Broden. Uh, your work is beautiful. And as you stated, has a focus on not just color or shape, but narrative. How do you see this type of work as a response to more platonic modernist or minimalist architecture that is still popular in Miami? Uh, good question. Um, I think there's a place for you know, you look at the Art Deco and you look at some of the MIMO and, you know, decoration at one time was almost the most important, you know, thing for an architect. You know, the drawing was always about what you put on the building. And they were, I guess, in their time, uh, ways to transmit information, um, maybe importance and power and, you know, or elegance and design. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's interesting how... Uh, architecture today has become, um, you know, so flat and, um, you know, and yeah, I, I think that there's definitely room for a narrative uh, in architecture um, so that, you know, you, you look at a building and the building talks about its use rather than just you know, and therefore it, it kind of explains itself more in terms of the facade. But yeah, yeah, when you look at it to what we see today, there's definitely something that um, could be added that, you know, in design. There's opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least an emotional response. <laughs> yeah, I think so. 
Uh, we have a few more questions. Can you talk a bit about the design parameters requested by Ocean Rescue? Sure. Um, Ocean Rescue wanted to uh, be sure that the tower could be moved and that there would be no loose components. When we did the first design, we actually had a stair that had to be removed in order to move, uh, move the tower. They wanted that. They wanted to have the long board. They wanted it such that when you came off of the uh, tower, you could immediately access the board without uh, losing visual contact if you're doing a rescue. Um, they wanted you know, major shade. Uh, we used uh, sliding windows that allowed us to have cross ventilation in all the corners. Um, you know, we had the two means of egress, which just made the thing a lot uh, easier to exit um, and still keep an eye on uh, the person that you're hoping to rescue. The other thing was the height. They wanted it at about eight feet so that uh, they would have a really large uh, vision perimeter. Um, so yeah, those right. were those were kind of the prerequisites. And then of course, being, uh, you know, be able to lock it up at night. Are they hurricane resistant? Was there a yeah. structural engineer involved? Yeah, we worked with Douglas Wood and Associates um, and uh, they engineered it. Um, I know that uh, one of them actually blew over. I'm not sure in which storm, but they're meant to be able to topple. They're also meant to be uh, pulled behind the dune. And, uh, you know, interesting enough in speaking about Doug Wood, Nick, Peretti, you were one of the <laughs> three people on our team, uh, one with Alex uh, Udolphin and uh, uh, Cynthia Octon, who, you know, worked with us on this project. So thank you for that, Nick. Of course, yeah, I know they put some time into it and some wind studies, and uh, mm -hmm. I believe from, from what I remember, uh, they were able to take about, uh, you know, category three winds before you, you get any uplift. Uh, so they did a pretty remarkable, uh, a remarkable job with, uh, with, with, with these towers. Yeah, it's uh, strong. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we have another question. Would you say your designs are typically American as opposed to European? in the same way as lifeguards themselves are an American phenomenon rather than European? Well, it's kind of an interesting question because one of the, um, I would say we've gotten more response from these towers from Italy than any other country. So maybe it is American and maybe it's their kind of, you know, their, their obsession or love with uh, American things, but there's definitely this attraction um, you know, by Europeans to them. Would I say they're American? Um, yes and no. I mean, in some ways, they're kind of like the changing booths that you see in Italy, those little houses that you see a lot of the beaches or the umbrellas, the formality of uh, European beaches. Um, so they, they kind of allude to it, but in terms of American phenomenon, maybe so. I grew up in New Jersey and uh, we would spend many a summer uh, down in Point Pleasant and Lavalette um, and, uh, you know, we had the boardwalk and the rides and the little, so in many ways, that was a big influence too, growing up. And I guess you would say that's a very American phenomenon, um, that boardwalk, uh, certainly in New Jersey experience. Well, they're definitely, you know, this direct representation of the culture and, and place and, uh, uh, and I guess in that sense, they, they could be considered, you know, uh, you know, uh, I guess American, but universally speaking, uh, you know, they, they're meant to take shape of anything. And, uh, and, and that's, that's kind of their anthropomorphic quality. And, uh, you know, they're, they're this kind of, a, you know, this kind of signature, this hieroglyph of, uh, of an instance, of a place, of, uh, you know, of an inhabitant, uh, uh, of, of, of the local environment. So I, I think, uh, you know, yes, they're American made and designed and, and conceived, but universally they're, you know, it's a, it's a form of representation. And that's, I think that's, that's you know, that's, that's kind of the universality about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, even this European thing, you know, in Italy, you go to Italy, Positano, these beach towns, Cicaterra, uh, and the vernacular is just the same. You know, it has these colorful, uh, expressive, you know, very kind of lively colors and emotions of, you know, of, of its inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very much, you know, a, a representation. It's a, it's almost a vehicle uh, yeah. of the local, of the local component. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you go to um, like uh, Greece or um, Turkey or wherever, and you have a lot of these white hill towns. And yet, yes, on the beach, you'll have a lot of color. So, you know, you could maybe make the, uh, you know, uh, sort of a reference to Miami being somewhat the same, a white tropical city with these very colorful follies on their beachfront. Yeah. What do you see as the new trends in architecture or in design? Mm hmm. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I suddenly feel like Andy Warhol. Um, <laughs> um, uh, what do I think about that? Uh, well, it's very exciting. I, I sit on crits now and then at FIU, and um, I'm just always amazed uh, the caliber of the work and the imagination. So, you know, there's part of me that I'm very old school, um, a little bit with this particular design. But when I see some of the uh, younger people and the, the work they're doing, it's just very exciting. And um, it's an amazing world. And, you know, they're very lucky to have some of the uh, software that they're using too that allows them so much freedom. So yeah. new design, there's a lot going on. And a lot of like what Lisa had said, you know, there's something to be said about maybe old school narrative and uh, what that means and what that could bring to work. Uh, you know, at, at the very least, experiential architecture, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I think that's about it in, in terms of questions. Oh, I have one more. What has been the most interesting response or interaction with the lifeguard stands? With the lifeguard or lifeguard? With the lifeguard stands, with the pro with with these stands, um, the most interesting response or interaction. Um. No, I, I guess I guess it's just the the popularity um, of them, you know, was notable. I, I you know, I was, I'm always amazed at how many people, you know, sort of identify. And I I like that I'm somewhat anonymous on this whole thing. Um, uh, and uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm always taken by how often people reference it and how such a simple, simple thing could uh, evolve into something, you know, that has um, a lot of visual significance. And, you know, for and the fact that it's Miami Beach, I, you know, I haven't necessarily built a lot of things here. So this is sort of like my smallest but biggest project. Um, so, I don't know. Well, it's, uh, you know, they're iconic. And uh, I think everyone kind of, you know, they see a postcard of Miami Beach somewhere and it's these towers oh, and yeah. they're, you know, they're just so popular and there's such a direct representation of the beach. It's kind of liveliness, uh, you know, it's colors. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I think you, 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 you mentioned this, it's a powerful statement and uh, it's, you know, it's funny that, that, you know, something that, I guess, relatively speaking, is is kind of this you know small project has this this such such a powerful iconic representation and uh, and just how global that that is. Yeah, I think it, again it says a lot about the power of design. Uh, something yeah. in that Beth Dunlop pointed out that it, art and architecture has this great ability to be transformative, and um, you know. Uh, and sometimes it's a very simple gesture can go a long way. Agreed. I think that's a good place to. Uh, I think that's a good place to end it. I think that's a, yeah. that's it for uh, that's it for uh, any questions. Thanks, Bill. Well, Always, great seeing uh, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's great. Great talk. Yeah. Pauline, you want to add anything? No, thanks a lot for uh, attending, everyone. We really appreciate it. And Nick, for bringing us this wonderful program. Mr. Lane, it was wonderful to meet you. Um, uh, this program is being recorded, and uh, we'll send everyone who attended a link uh, once it's up on our YouTube page. So if you want to share the love, feel free to do that. And um, check out AIAMiami.org for all the upcoming events, uh, especially the gala. And that's it. Have a great night, everyone. And thank you so much for attending. And thanks, Mr. Thank Lane. You. Appreciate thank you, it. Thank you, Colleen, and everyone else. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bill. Have a good night. Night.